Good morning or good afternoon to all of you, depending on where you're joining us from. We are the Penn Institute for Urban Research, this forum on urban informality. A group of early career researchers across different disciplines and institutions that explore how informality shapes the urban environment. We encourage interactions across academic and professional settings and seek to foster greater collaboration between researchers and practitioners working on issues of urban informality. For those of you who are not members, we strongly encourage you to consider joining us by scanning the QR code you see on the screen or clicking the link in the chat that you will see shortly. Sam, Stephanie, Anushka and I are excited to welcome our distinguished panel of speakers and attendees to this first conversation on informality in 2023, moderated by our very own Jeannie Birch. Professor Birch is the Lawrence Neustorff Chair of Urban Research and Education here at Penn. She teaches courses in global urbanization and the doctoral seminar. She serves as the chair of the graduate group in city and regional planning and is the co-director of the Penn Institute for Urban Research that houses the forum, the editor of the City in the 21st Century series at the University of Pennsylvania Press and co-editor of the SSRN Urban Research e-journal. Before I hand over to Professor Birch, I just wanted to let our participants know that we are recording this session. And while the panelists will present, we have disabled the chat and muted all attendees. However, we very strongly encourage you to put your questions in the Q&A, which you will see at the bottom of the screen. I now hand over to Professor Birch. Thank you very much, Kimberly, and all the members of the Forum on Urban Informality. I want to praise you for the wonderful work that you are doing in promoting knowledge about this very important area uh, that, as many of you know, uh, informal settlements house about a billion residents and will continue to do so in many of the cities of the global south. And we are very concerned about how to understand the dynamics of urban informality, how to provide public services for them, and, and how to involve the residents in the decisions that are happening around the world with regard to their livelihoods and their lives. Today, we are very happy to welcome James Mensa from the University of Ghana and Vincent Kitio from UN Habitat. I understand that Vincent is having a little bit of difficulty with connections, so we will um, introduce him a, a little later, but we'll have as our first speaker, James Mensa. Dr. Mensah is a lecturer in the Department of Public Administration and Health Services Management at the University of Ghana Business School. Dr. Mensah also serves as the Chief Local Development and Resilient Advisor to the Accra Metropolitan Assembly, where he's played a major role in various policies, in particular the development of Accra's resilience strategy. But where we have had the most fun and the most intellectual excitement has been working with Dr. Mensa on research, looking at the provision of electricity in informal settlements. Dr. Mensa has done absolutely uh, landmark work in his field work and assessment of uh, the provision of energy to informal settlements um, in Accra, Ghana. So I'm going to turn this work over to him today. Uh, if you would like to read some of his articles that he has published. He's published in many of the most important journals um, in international development, but also he has uh, two policy briefs that are part of the Climate Center's uh, uh, Climate Center and Energy Policies uh, uh, working paper and brief series. We will put those uh, links in the uh, chat, uh, or we will provide those links for the, um, for the participants later. But Dr. Mensa, please join us. Thank you, Jeannie. Thank you for such a wonderful presentation. And thank you to all our participants. Um, I'm happy to meet you and I'm happy to share my research with you. So my research this afternoon is about delivering electricity to informal settlement dwellers in two informal settlements in Accra. And I will specifically want to look at alternative sources of energy to informal settlements dwellers in three informal settlements in Accra. To start off, 
I want to just say that the 21st century has not only seen growth in population, but also growth in urbanization to the extent that about 57% of the world population live in informal settlement. And majority of these people live in urban cities in the developing world. This growth in urbanization has not only brought opportunities, but challenges as well. And one of the major challenges of urbanization in developing world has to do with the growth of informal settlements. Clearly, we see that the number of people who live in informal settlements keeps growing to the extent that one out of three people live currently live in informal settlements. So about 1 billion people across the world live in informal settlements. And this is projected to go up even as we go into the 2030. One of the basic issue, one of the basic issue of informal settlement has to do with access to basic services. So informal settlement dwellers lack access to basic services and a typical basic service that is lacking in informal settlement is access to electricity, sustainable electricity. So despite the fact that electricity is very important and contribute to livelihood in informal settlement, close to 733 million people across the world lack access to sustainable electricity. And most of these people live in the developing world. So a picture to your left shows the countries across the world that are among the top 20 countries that have energy deficient. So if you look at it, Nigeria has the highest energy deficient and then it goes as to Sudan, Southern Sudan, that has about 10% of the people lacking access to sustainable energy. In fact, this situation has brought other challenges to people who live in informal settlement. It makes it very difficult for them to escape poverty because energy is very, very important in the fight against poverty. And not only poverty, there are health issues. The, the ability to live productive life has also been constrained as a result of lack of access to sustainable and efficient energy. And most importantly, these people who live in informal system will find it very difficult to, to achieve the SDGs 1, 2, 3, up to 5, and SDGs 8, 10, 11. All these are SDGs that are connected to sustainable energy. And it will be very difficult for these people to achieve these SDGs. In fact, they rely on, on crude methods of energy, such as the picture I'm showing here. This is a typical picture from informal settlements in Accra. And the one thing that I want to say about this picture is that sometimes people who live in former part of the city sometimes think that they are out of this situation. However, if you look at the picture here, this is food that you are cooking to go and sell. And those of you who are familiar with Accra, this is kinky that they are actually cooking to go and sell. So people cook this kinky in informal settlement and then put them in, in, in taxis, in buses to the former part of the city to go and then sell. So you may not live in an informal settlement, but you are buying food that is actually prepared in informal settlement. Of late, they also tend to use some um, torch lights and other sources of energy to be able to keep their life moving. Now, let's look at Ghana. Ghana, as a country, has a population of 31 million. And out of this, 56.7% of the population live in urban areas, whereas 33.3 live in rural areas. If you go deeper, you see that in urban areas, one of the challenges 
in Ghanaian urban areas has to do with the growth of informal settlement. Overall, in total, 33.3% of Ghanaians live in informal settlement. But if you come to urban areas such as Accra, 54% of the population live in informal settlement. How do they get access to electricity? If you come to Ghana, you see that electricity is mainly produced by Volta River Authority and independent power producers. And this electricity is transmitted by an organization called Grico. And this Grico will now supply the electricity to ECG, which is Ghana Electricity Company of Ghana. So ECG op operates mainly in the southern part of Ghana and NITCO operates in the northern part of Ghana. In terms of electricity coverage, or electricity production, you see that Ghana's electricity mix is made up of 33% hydro and 66% thermal. Overall, 87% of Ghanaians have access to electricity. But when you disaggregate this data, you see that in urban areas, 91% of the people have access to electricity. And this goes down to the fact that 50% of the people in rural areas have access to electricity. But when you come specifically to informal settlement, it's as high as 88% of the people who live in informal settlement having access to electricity. So in my first study that I conducted in these three informal settlement, I found out that all the people who live in informal settlement have access to electricity. How do they get this electricity? They connive with electricity officials. They also tap the electricity from nearby homes because the data actually shows that 75 of the people uh, actually get electricity illegal way. And only 15% of them get their electricity legal. How do they use the electricity? They use it for the following purposes, just to light their houses, just to do some ironing, to freeze their food and to power their television. So you see that electricity is mainly not used for cooking purposes, simply because it is expensive to them. In fact, the biggest challenge is how to connect the electricity and how to pay the tariff. You will see that connection of electricity costs informal settlement dwellers as high as 500% of the original cost. 500% of the original cost, because you have to connive with electricity officials to be able to get this. Because the requirement to access electricity, people who live in informal settlement do not have those requirements. You need, you need a site plan, you need a building permit, which people who live in informal settlement do not have. And therefore they have to rely on electricity officials, they have to connive with them, they have to, connect with contractors and middlemen to be able to assess this. Also, they have to buy electricity poles because in their environment, the nature of the environment is such that there are no electricity poles within the community. So if you want a meter in your house and legal light to your house, then it means that you need to actually um, bribe people bribe contractors, middlemen to be able to get in. And this makes the cost very high. It, it was also found out that the tariff that they pay is as high as 60% compared to those who live in former settlement. Why? Because they have to connect electricity from somebody's meter. And this connection actually is a business somebody who lives in an informal settlement actually connect with electricity official to get legal connection to electricity. And the person then use the meter or the light for commercial purposes. People will draw or tap the light from the, the, that meter and actually pay. So how do they get energy to cook? In terms of cooking, they rely mostly on charcoal, but 70.5% of informal settlement dwellers in the three steady community use charcoal. Others use firewood. Few of them use LPG, electric stove, kerosene, and even plastic, even plastic. Our first study showed that 
informal settlement have the potential to go to use alternative sources of energy that is off grid solutions that was one of the findings that we found out from our first study therefore we decided to take that as a second study to follow up and see what are the alternative sources of energy in informal settlement and this is what we found out first we found out that the informal settlement dwellers are shifting to solar systems such as solar torch lights so a typical example of a solar torch light is this one that is put in the sun to recharge so that they can use it in the evening then we also found that in one of the communities that the UNDP with the support from the Japan government put up a community clinic in one of the steady area and because it is difficult to draw electricity to the clinic, they decided to go solar. So this clinic, as you see here, is fully on solar. It's fully on solar. Another finding from the community also shows that the house to your left is fully on biogas. So we have discovered biogas, we have discovered uh, the use of solar and Mainly, uh, we have discovered solar, we have discovered uh, biogas in the community. So this house, as you see it to your left, is actually on biogas. So the whole system is connected and everybody in the household use the light from the biogas. To your right is a public toilet, which is constructed by a private company with the support of the Accra Metropolitan Assembly, which is cited in one of the study communities. And this public toilet actually generates biogas. So the community members actually patronize this public toilet, they pay to use it, they go there to also bath. The biogas that is generated from this toilet is actually used first to heat the water for people who want to uh, bath at this place and then they pay to bath and then it also generates gas so that anybody who wants to buy gas from the biogas system can actually do that with their cylinder and go and use in their homes so these are some of the findings from the community now we have seen the following the following challenges first is the fact that it is very expensive to set up these alternative sources of energy in informal settlement. The biogas system is very expensive to set up and also the solar system is expensive. One of the biggest challenges we also found that has to do with maintenance. The systems are not being maintained. So the house that is on biogas is actually beginning to experience some challenges because of issues of maintenance. It is not being maintained and therefore it is now not operating on full capacity. The other challenge that we found out was the scale gap. The scale gap. They don't have the basic skill to be able to maintain this system. Neither do they have the skill to be able to operate this system. So on the whole, we found out that there is 100% access to electricity in informal settlement. The, however, only 75% of the people got the electricity legally. On, only 15% of the people, sorry, only 15% of the people got the electricity legally uh, to the extent that 75% of them actually get electricity through illegal means. And the cost of connection is as high as 500% of the original cost, whereas the tariff is as high as 60% of the original cost. In terms of cooking, they rely on charcoal as the main source of cooking. Now we see some off-grid options in the community, which are basically the solar and the biogas system. However, there are still challenges in maintaining and these systems, as well as the expensive nature of these systems. Our recommendation is that there's the need for government to support 
informal settlement to be able to move to off-grid sources of energy, simply because the tariff on this equipment is expensive. So if government can reduce the tariff on this equipment, it will be very, very helpful for them to be able to buy some of this equipment to fix. And then we also uh, recommended from the study that it is very, very important for government to provide some financial support, some NGOs and civil society organizations operating within informal settlement or in the energy sector should be able to provide some financial support to people who live in informal settlements to be able to go off grid. There's also the need to raise awareness about some of these alternative sources of energy that informal settlement dwellers can adopt. And then another find, another recommendation from the study is that there's the need to give them some basic training to upgrade their skills to be able to maintain the system and operate the system. Finally, uh, we recommend that government must make alternative sources of energy a priority in informal settlement. So I bring my presentation to uh, a close and I welcome feedback from participants. Thank you very, very much, uh, Dr. Mensa. This is a wonderful presentation. And one of the things you didn't show in your slides is what the nature of the illegal connections are and how unsafe they are and the problems of fire and other situations that could arise from these kinds of connections. So we do see that there are solutions, but the solutions are not widespread. Um, we would like now to turn to Vincent Kikio, who is an architect, trained as an architect. He is a, a, a doctorate in um, building, appropriate building technologies and energy efficiency and uh, from uh, Sapienza University in Rome. And he is currently head of the Urban Energy Unit of UN Habitat. And he has been working diligently to improve energy accessibility in informal settlements throughout Africa and other places. And he has going to take us now from the case study that we saw here in Accra and the very specific problems that we saw in Accra to show exactly what's happening in the area of the world that he's working in. Vincent, welcome. Dr. Dr. Kitio, I should say, welcome to our Energy Week presentation. Thank you very much, uh, Madam uh, Jenny Bish. And um, also thank you very much, the organizer of this event. Uh, thank you, Dr. James Mensa. I follow your presentation with a lot of interest and a lot of uh, um, attention. I apologies, I had some, some problem because I'm, I'm actually connected from a rural area in, uh, in, in Cameroon where uh, I'm on mission um, related to energy as well. And um, I want to thank the organizer for uh, inviting UN Habitat to this important uh, discussion to share the work that UN Habitat has been uh, uh, working in order to increase, improve access access to energy by the urban poor, urban and peri-urban poor. I think Dr. Mensa has set the, sta the, the, the stage. I will just uh, bring a global perspective um, into showing that uh, what you saw in Ghana is actually what is happening in the global south, in the urban area and global south, being in sub-Saharan Africa, being in Latin America, and also being in Southeast Asia, the, the, the issue the, are similar. Uh, and perhaps uh, through my presentation, I will also share with you what UN Habitat uh, together with colleagues have been doing to, to, to sort of increase access to energy by the urban poor. Let me, I would like to share my screen uh, so that I'm able to, uh,
Um, as, as Dr. Kichio said, we are having uh, connection problems. We request you to bear with us for a second while he connects back. He's connecting from uh, Ruru Cameroon. So give us a second and he should be back. While we're waiting, we have a couple of questions in the question and answer um, situation um, for Dr. Mensa. One question is, are there any emerging workforce development programs for solar in, Ga in Ghana? Please, can you say that again? Are there any workforce programs to train people for solar? For now, not that I know of not that I know of. What I know is the national government is um, looking at energy efficiency. And for the past six, seven years, they try to exchange people's old gadgets for new gadgets. So if you have a refrigerator, uh, oh, you know, they have this um, issue of uh, star one, star two, star three. Energy um, efficient, yes. <laughs> exactly. So uh, you bring your old refrigerator and come for a new one at a subsidized cost. Um, that is what I know of. Uh, so it's a, it's more um, a startup situation. We have another question from a Professor Casanelli who's asking, if private brokers or middlemen have been successful in providing access to electricity through informal arrangements, what is the incentive for municipal governments to invest in energy alternatives for these settlements? Yes, this is a very important question. Uh, <laughs> I think that is a cost to, to the local government. So it is important for them to provide this because look, this comes with issues of not only a cost to the energy provider, that is the electricity company of Ghana. And the electricity company of Ghana is so overburdened with a lot of debt. So that's the first reason why local government must provide electricity or alternative sources of energy to informal settlement dwellers. The second one has to do with the rampant fires in this informal settlement. So, and the cost will always come back to the local government. So it is important that local government steps in to be able to uh, provide alternative sources so that they can also manage or benefit from their resources. Otherwise they keep spending a lot of resources in trying to fix these fire issues, trying to provide some support for people who have lost their properties during these fires. Thank you. Uh, we have Vincent back. We'll get back to these questions after Vincent's presentation. Welcome back, <laughs> Dr. Kitio. Yes. Thank, thank you. Apology for that technical issue. Um, I'm not in my office, so I don't enjoy all the technical uh, support. But anyway, let me, so my presentation will be, I, I will just, this is um, uh, uh, the plan of the presentation. I will just uh, explain to you what Yon Habitat is doing in the urban energy uh, area, and also um, give, present some challenges. I know that Dr. Mensa has already mentioned some of them, but at the same time, I'm also going to share the opportunities. And, and again, talk about slum electrification program and, and, and share some few case study with you. And again, go back again to the lot of potential and solution that uh, Dr. Mensa mentioned, because there are quite a lot of uh, solution in cities in how to increase energy access. And then I will also talk about empowerment training that Dr. Mensa has alluded. So what UN Habitat, um, the Urban Energy Unit of uh, UN Habitat has actually uh, three major um, activities. Uh, our role is to assist local and regional and uh, national uh, authority to increase access to modern, clean, reliable energy services in the urban area for both the, the, uh, the common citizen and also the urban poor. Oh dear. He's lost his connection again. <laughs> Let 
this is the problem with energy throughout the global south. We can see it in real time. Um, I would like to mention that this session is part of the University of Pennsylvania's Energy Week, in which there are several lectures and uh, uh, events going on this whole week to bring attention to the energy issues throughout the world. And uh, this is a special session as we are focusing on the global south. But we can uh, go back while we're waiting to some of the questions that we had for Dr. M Dr. Um, Mensa. In particular, I think we weren't clear about how, first of all, it's a national government that supplies the energy, number one. Number two, um, the middlemen who are providing this, talk, tell us a little bit of, more about the middlemen and why we wouldn't want to support the middlemen exactly as, as a solution to the electricity issues in informal settlements. Kini, can you, can you ask the question again? I lost connection a bit. Okay, sorry. Um, Dr. C Casanelli asked, if the middlemen are providing the electricity for the informal settlements, why not just let them continue to do so? Why bother with a government provision of electricity? Okay, thank you. So as I mentioned earlier on, so these middlemen, what do you do actually benefit them and it becomes a cost to the electricity company of Ghana. So eventually the electricity company of Ghana has a lot of debt, a lot of debt has accrued that they need to pay. So if the government or the local government doesn't come in to provide electricity to them, yes, they do get electricity illegally, but this becomes a cost to the energy provider, that is the electricity company of Ghana. Secondly, they don't do this well, which often leads to a lot of fires. And therefore, when these fires happen, a lot of people's properties are destroyed, people's properties are burned, and the local government is asked, the central government is asked to come and support these people. So, and especially in Ghana, where we often make these issues political, you will see the president, you will see the minister rushing there to go and then console with the people and promise them, they'll give them, uh, they'll support them, they'll give them the necessary support. This also becomes a cost to the state. So yes, informal contractors or contractors, connection men, middlemen are giving them access to electricity, but I think that is important for the state and local government to do it for them and do it proper so that they pay the right amount, the energy provider doesn't lose the money, and also the associated challenges of fires will be controlled. Um, we are going to put up uh, Vincent's slides so that when he comes back, he can just speak to them and say next, but we'll continue our conversation with James uh, until we do have him back. Uh, James, this is, the energy is just the tip of the iceberg when we talk about informal settlements, correct? Tell us a little bit about public services. Oh, here's Vincent is back, but while we get him set up, um, tell us a little bit about the lack of public services and in informal settlements. Generally, in informal settlements in Ghana, they lack access to almost all the public services. There's no water. And in fact, the water issue, I want to mention that it is not only in informal settlement, close to 80% of Accra do not have access to potable water. That's the first one. When you come to issues of uh, basic services like schools, most informal settlements in Ghana do not have public schools. So you see private people trying to put up just small schools in their houses, uh, schools that are not up to standard. So that is it. If you look at issues of waste management, informal settlements are so uh, have a lot of issues with waste management. You see a lot of waste in there. So basically, if you talk about informal settlement, they lack access to almost all the public services. Okay, I think we have Dr. Kikio back. Are you back? Let's go to his third slide. So when he does get back, we will. Okay. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. We'll run yes, the slides for you. Just say next. Yes. The problem is uh, 
is is that that the the, the bandwidth um, the right. bandwidth yes. yes yes I think that that should be I saw I also removed the the, the video yes um, anyway um, we have access our our role as we inhabit that we are mandated to help local government um, also to mainstream energy efficiency measure into housing policy building code building practices. And then um, lastly, to promote renewable energy technology in cities. Uh, we do this uh, through the following activity. We uh, organize awareness creation, policy review, capacity building, uh, development of energy planning and strategy, and also mobiliza mobilization of resources to promote uh, uh, energy access both for the urban poor and also um, uh, energy uh, policy uh, development. And also, we also conduct demonstration and pilot project. Next slide. So I, I, will, I will just uh, say that in the context, just to give you some, uh, some contextual issue related to the, to the challenges faced by the urban uh, population in Sub-Sahara in uh, developing country, mostly in Sub-Sahara Africa and also uh, Asia and uh, Latin America. We have population growth, rapid population growth, rapid urbanization are taking place in the global south, following by the increased demand of shelter, infrastructure, basic services, energy, job, education, um, and also consumer products. Uh, we, uh, what is happening in, in Africa, for example, we have an increase in the population uh, between uh, 3.5 to 4.4% 4. 4 annually. This is quite huge. At the same time, we also notice an increase in the demand for energy that is estimated between 78%, the annual demand. But what, what we are seeing happening on the ground, the increase in the supply is very low. That's why there is a, a big mismatch between the demand and the supply for, for, for energy. Um, and we uh, noticed that the majority of the urban poor still rely on biomass energy for cooking. Dr. Mensah mentioned it. And uh, over 50% of the national energy is generated in most of this country from uh, fossil fuel uh, to bridge the energy gap. And, and again, uh, this is also come at a very high cost. And, and, and you, can, you, you can consider what is happening now with the crisis in Ukraine, where the, the, the population, uh, particularly the urban poor cannot afford the increasing cost of energy. Next slide, please. Um, the other element which is uh, very important to notice is, um, is that the rapid population uh, or urbanization that is taking place is being done in the absence of planning. And uh, we are seeing um, uh, in, in most of the urban area that between 30 to 60% of the urban population are living in informal settlement, without road, as you can see from, from this uh, slide, without proper infra other infrastructure like electricity, that's why some of them end up uh, uh, paying very high from these services. And also um, we have noticed, and, and, and this was also confirmed from the Mensa presentation, the majority of the urban dweller mostly this, the, 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 the slum dweller are what we call energy poor. The sense that they spend more than 50%, no, more than 10% of their income on energy services, making them uh, urban uh, energy poor. They relied on traditional form of energy, wood, charcoal, kerosene, and it was already LPG, kerosene, and also electricity um, compared to other citizens. And we also um, uh, realize in, that in um, uh, the, the majority of the population do not have access to reliable uh, modern energy services. Next slide. While on one hand, 
there is a need for access to energy. On the other hand, there is a wastage of energy. What we see, another uh, uh, challenges that are faced by all these global South country is the fact that energy is used in an efficient way. Uh, we see a lot of wastage of energy in the building sector, in the transportation sector, and also in the industrial sector, because basically the architecture is not designed according to the climate. Most of the time we see replica of uh, buildings designed for the northern cold climate. We see the replica in the southern climate and, and therefore required a lot of energy for the operation. And we also notice, uh, I mentioned earlier, the absence of adequate urban planning, where we have a lot of sprawl going on with low density development leading to high energy demand. And, and we also see uh, the fact that um, most of the transportation system are based on private car, and uh, which also come with uh, additional uh, consequences like air pollution, um, and and, and um, green gas has emission, and and also uh, we also notice the prolification of the on planet settlement. In fact, um, on average, forty percent um, the, the the annual urbanization rate is estimated. UN Habitat estimated that the urbanization rate is similar to the population rate around forty percent annually and uh, 4%, sorry. And what we notice that this rapid uh, urbanization is actually happening in the informal sector. Next slide. Now, let's talk about the key uh, item of the day, which is the uh, electrification access by the slum dweller. These images are uh, what um, some call the spaghetti connection. This is what you see happening in most of the slum informal settlement in, uh, in the global south, uh, where every household has a, a cable bringing somewhere. And it may also seem like um, uh, the, telephone, the telephone connection uh, some year back before the arrival of the mobile phone. But this is actually what, hap what it ha is happening in most of the slum in, um, in the global south. Slum dwellers have not access, have not legal access to electricity. This is very important, the legal access to electricity because utility company are not allowed to connect um, electricity system in uh, informal um, settlement. Uh, and therefore, uh, we found a lot of illegal connection. And that's why uh, it become very expensive for those people living there. Uh, the cost of the, the, the access in, in, to energy is very high compared to other you know, normal connection. Um, we also uh, realized, I just mentioned that earlier on, that they spend between 10 to 15%, according to the, uh, the place where they are, on their uh, of their income to energy. Um, what also is frequent is the unsafe connection uh, with fire hazards, very frequent electrocution, electrocution that is also very frequent. It's, it's basically every every year, every, every, every month you find on the newspaper that so-and-so has been electrocuted because of the illegal connection. And of course, there is also a big mafia around um, the illegal connection. And, and this is a loss, the huge loss for the power utility company because they are intermediary that are, um, um, that, that are stealing and selling electricity, but at the, at the same time, also they are huge um, cost related to, um, to the transformer, overloading of transformer. And that's, that, that is really, next slide please. That's, that's really great problem. So uh, in uh, the beginning of 2000, uh, USAID 
Uh, together with uh, some government, they start the government of India, government of South Africa, and also government of Brazil, started a program on uh, slum electrification. And, and this program was basically to address the issue that I've just mentioned, um, the issue of thefts of electricity, the, the issue of huge losses in terms of infrastructure, and also, most importantly, the issue of access. The idea is um, uh, we need to allow access to the majority of the urban population. Because what I'm not saying is that 60%, between 40 to 60% of the urban population live in informal settlement. This is where they can afford services. And, and, and the fact that you have this huge number of people living there, uh, if they are stealing electricity, utility comp uh, company also find it very difficult to, um, uh, to, to, to increase, uh, to provide services to, to, to other part of the, of the city. So a proper design of slum electrification intervention has several advantages. Some, some of them were also mentioned by my predecessor. predecessor uh, they can reach out to more people with less investment, given that a slum dweller already have a huge number of people living there. They can also reduce heavy loss incurred by the illegal connection. Um, they, they, the government also, um, through this type of intervention, also improve the living condition of people and, and most importantly, increase access uh, more safety and also security um, of the urban dwellers. So there are a lot of advantages, um, opportunity on slum electrification. Sorry, I just realized that I was muted. So, so the first example of uh, the uh, slum electrification program that I have here, come from uh, Ahmedabad in, uh, in India. Um, this is where uh, the government provided uh, what they call no objection certificate to the power utility that was also um, made by a, a, a local um, um, uh, NGO that was, that was brought in for awareness creation and, um, and also the admin about working together with the electricity company. So once the legal issue, the legal barriers has been removed by the government and the electricity company uh, came in, they work hand to hand with the local, uh, with the local NGO, with the local civil society to implement the first um, um, uh, slum electrification in India with a financial, financial support from the US. The result of this project was tremendous. First of all, access, increased access to electricity, more safety came, and also improvement of the living condition of the population. Next slide. And after uh, uh, India, uh, Cape Town, the same, concept was replicated in, uh, in, in Cape Town, where traditionally uh, the, 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 the population of, uh, of the township uh, were used to uh, electricity theft passing through intermediary. They didn't want to see uh, utility company. They were not allowed to enter in their, in their neighborhood. And therefore, they create a consortium, a consortium made of uh, civil society organization that will sort of approach them and explain the reason why it is important to have a proper uh, connection system. And But what was very interesting in this case was the preparing prepare system, prepare electricity system. This was the first time that this, this uh, prepare system was implemented whereby each dweller could just pay what he can afford because the traditional connection of electricity is very expensive, is out of the reach of the urban poor. And with this prepare system, 
uh, they were able to connect uh, more electricity, uh, more families connect electricity to more more household, and and it was the estimated before two thousand that um, this slum electrification program has actually enabled reduce the theft of electricity by seventy percent. And um, what is also very important with this uh, example of Cape Town is that this uh, slum electrification based on uh, the technology and also on awareness creation has been replicated in most of the townships all over South Africa. And, and follow the successful example of South Africa, this program was now replicated in Kenya. Next slide. Um, in uh, 2000, starting 2004, 2005, this is where here in, uh, in Kenya, where um, uh, the, the prepayment the, uh, metering system were, was put in place. I was actually involved uh, with the uh, utility company in, uh, um, in a, an awareness program and also capacity building because habitat was, uh, was actually very instrumental in the introduction of the slum electrification program in Kenya. And we, um, we facilitate uh, the training of uh, Kenya utility company, which initially were not, um, were not collaborating in the slum because they see slum as a place where uh, they are losing a lot of their market. And uh, we send them to Brazil because at the same time, there was also a slum electrification program in Brazil. Uh, they went there for training. And then uh, after returning from there, uh, they were able now to design a program for Kenya. And then at the same time, since the Kenyan government has invested a lot of electricity, they also wanted to have more connection. And SLAM was really the place where they could, uh, they could make more connection. And through the prepare system, they were able to connect several households. Next slide. Next slide, please. Yes, so those were the example of, uh, of, of slum electrification program. I just want to mention that uh, there was one slide before this one that was on the, um, on the potential that city do have a lot of potential of renewable energy sources, uh, being solar, being wind, being uh, biomass from uh, uh, organic waste, and also being hydro in some places where we have um, uh, rivers. So those, those could also be used to increase energy access. The other element, which is another opportunity, is the fact that uh, municipal government should also embrace to start developing energy strategies. It's very important. And uh, through the energy strategy, they can actually address the issue of energy access for the urban poor. My my uh, Dr. Mensa mentioned about the use of charcoal, the use of kerosene, the use of candle for lighting, the use of biogas. But this can only have major success if there is a strategy in place. And this is one element where UN Habitat is very keen in assisting municipality in developing their sustainable energy uh, strategy, um, planning, and, 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 and at the same time also, um, uh, uh, that will also promote energy demand management. Next slide, please. Next slide, yes. Um, the other point, what is also happening, and, and, and again, I'm sharing this with you because I believe um, it is important that a uh, city cannot just be seen as the consumer of energy, but they can also be seen as a prosumer. They should produce, they can produce, they have the potential to produce most of the energy uh, that, um, that they use. Um, in basically what, what, what is happening in, the, in, in developing countries, in the, in the global South, we realize that um, um, uh, city consume between uh, uh, 20 to 30% of 
energy, uh, no, sorry, uh, between 20 to 30% of energy consumed in city um, can, be, can be actually safe. So the, there are huge potential, huge saving potential in the energy consumption in city if, if proper design are put in place. I mentioned about green buildings using a green building design. I mentioned about proper planning with adequate um, density, compact city. I also mentioned about the fact that uh, uh, we need also to have more cities, more, more, more streets, more, more open space to allow for a better um, transportation system and avoid wastage. And again, also by also promoting green economy, we, we could release most of the energy which could be used also in the informal sector. Next slide, please. Next slide, yes. Uh, this slide is about um, training. Sorry, sorry, back to the, to, to the, no, no, sorry. Back again. Go back again. Yes. Yes, yes. This is one of the very important activity that Habitat has been doing um, in the last, in the last uh, six, six years or you can say eight years, where we decided to demystify the concept of renewable energy technology. Uh, we uh, started training the youth on how to locally assemble solar lantern, on how to produce charcoal uh, briquettes, which is uh, or, or rather uh, uh, clean, low carbon charcoal, and also on uh, building improved energy efficient stores. Um, because we realized that the youth being the majority of the urban population, uh, rather the population of uh, the, 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 the global south, uh, in part on average, uh, the 70% of the urban population in, uh, on the population of global south uh, have less than 30 years. And most of them are just less. So we realize that as the demand for energy increase, it is important that we uh, provide the youth with a scheme so that they can actually, instead of buying finished products, uh, they can actually be involved uh, in the production of, uh, of modern energy system. With this training, we have been able to train more than 2,000 youths in different, in different activity. Uh, some of them are now uh, running their startup on a clean cooking system, uh, charcoal production. And again, we, we believe that other are also promoting energy efficiency measure. We believe that this, this is a, um, an, an action that can uh, produce a lot of uh, um, uh, good intervention on the ground. So the next slide, and which is also the last one, uh, the conclu conclusion for this presentation. So, May, the first thing that we have over all these years of uh, the work of the urban energy, we have realized that there is a growing demand for sustainable energy system in urban areas, uh, mostly for social and economic development. You know, these are the countries where we are witnessing uh, industrialization are taking place. Um, more and more people are moving in the urban area and therefore they are requiring uh, modern energy. They use energy uh, for many activities. Therefore, there is a huge demand. And again, if we are talking about climate change mitigation, this is also an area where we really need to put a lot of effort to promote that. There, there are also a lot of untapped potential in terms of energy efficiency and renewable energy. I, I just mentioned some of them. Um, strategy and solution to promote slum electrification has been developed and implemented with success. So again, what needs is to look at this strategy and try to promote where um, they, they are needed. And, and that is also the work of Land Habitat uh, together with partner to um, SDG, for example, SDG 7. It's important to mention that 
SDG 7 is about energy access, energy efficiency, is about deployment of renewable energy technology. So all this work uh, fit into the uh, energy seven. Well, policy, policy will, political will, very important and enabling policy are the major drive of success for uh, slum electrification program. So it's not just a matter of technology, but it's also a matter of governance. Uh, and that's why partnership between the public, the private entity, and also the community-based organization is very critical, critical to ensure success. So investing in slum electrification is a win-win situation and it is a cost-effective investment because as I mentioned in the slum area, you have a majority of the population are concentrated there. If you want to increase your energy um, access, that is where you have to, uh, to focus your attention. And I'm also glad that the World Bank has been investing, uh, investing a lot uh, resources um, in, in the slum electrification program. So local government need to put in place their energy strategy. Of course, we cannot, I cannot finish this intervention without mentioning the key role of the strategy and policy. Because uh, uh, just in intervention, technical te technology, the process. And also, I did not mention about the innovation, but it's also very important that uh, the innovation that we have been seeing uh, recently is very important. So I finish here. Thank you very much. And uh, apology for the technical issue that we had. What a spectacular talk uh, to give us an overview and add texture, a good deal of texture and information to uh, Dr. Mensah's presentation. I believe we have a number of questions from the audience and that we will open it up and see if people would like to actually ask their questions themselves. I'm not seeing any hands up, so I could ask the questions that have come through to me. Brian Enslein, is Brian Enslein here? Yes, I'm here, Dr. Birch. Oh, great. You had a question. Sure. Had several um, questions. <laughs> I had a couple. Um, first is for, uh, for Dr. Mensa. Um, I, I was wondering, I, I saw, you know, I noticed connections between what you're doing and, and efforts to you know, reduce, re reduce kind of, uh, Poor gas sources, like from from wood fired soap and things like that. I, I was wondering if you worked at all in uh, carbon credits or have any carbon credit linkages to your programs. That's my first question. I'll I'll, I'll follow up with the, the second one. Please, can you say that again? I uh, I I was wondering if if you have uh, had any experience uh, or successes, especially in in carbon credits with the with in urban slums have you looked into relating uh different types of technologies and, and carbon credits to implementing different types of solutions in urban slums for, for now um i haven't come across anything like that in ghana the only thing that i've seen is about uh, a civil society organization called alliance for clean cook stove trying to give modern cook stove to um people in informal settlements so that it doesn't generate a lot of smoke in order to uh, pollute the environment and the food, poison the food that they eat. But in terms of carbon credits, uh, I don't think I've come across anything like that. But it's something that I can follow up. And Brian, you had a second question? Sure. This, this one's for uh, for Dr. Uh, Katio. Um, I was wondering for your example project, I, I would love to hear more information around uh, enforcement, how you had uh, for carrying out, have, what, what, how would you deal with non-payments? Um, and then also how you dealt with, it sounds like you had neighbors are paying different rates, basically paying what they could afford. So I, I would love to hear more detail around uh, how that was carried out and, and any specific examples you have. Thanks so much. 
Thank you very much for that question. Perhaps I will start with the first question that you asked about the carbon credits. Uh, just to say that um, at least uh, from um, the Kenya, um, Kenya and also Rwanda perspective, there are quite a number of uh, carbon credit um, organization uh, that are sponsoring um, reducing the cost of uh, input cook stove so that they can be affordable for the urban dweller. And then in, uh, in exchange, they, they are collecting the carbon, um, the, the, the carbon credit. Um, they, they are more and more um, company that are doing mostly company from, from Europe that are promoting that. Um, we are now also as UN Habitat, we want to encourage such carbon credits as a vehicle of financing uh, activities, not only um, in the energy field, but also in the housing field, uh, where we can actually look at it as one of the sources of funding that will enable, uh, for example, uh, the promotion of uh, sustainable waste management, uh, where um, a lot of um, uh, uh, greenhouse gas emission can also be offset. And, and, then, and then, then at the same time also increase access. Now, related to the question uh, regard, regarding the enforcement, uh, I have to say that um, uh, uh, through the presentation, you will realize that um, uh, the prepare system, um, the box is actually installed three meter uh, on the pole so that nobody can interfere, can tamper. And it's also it has also been provided with um, with um, uh, instrument uh, that uh, once you tamper it, it just go off. You need the utility company to come in and uh, put it back. Uh, again, being a prepare system, you just you can only use what you you have paid for. Actually, pay in advance and then you consume it. And in in some case, uh, of course, there. are there will always be um, uh, defaults, but uh, these most of the time are clearly um, being addressed. Um, at the moment, the, the utility company, they have access in the, um, in, in the slum, in the informal settlement, also because the cost, the final cost of electricity that is being provided through these services is less than what they use to to pay. So it's also a win-win situation in the sense that they don't want to go back to a situation where they, where they were paying more for electricity. I wish also to mention that uh, uh, the prepare system that we are seeing also happening in the informal settlement is not just on electricity, but it's also on, uh, on LPG, on gas. Uh, those who can afford, uh, they just get the appliances. They, they, they now there are, they are a lot of private company, including also the telephone, the telecommunication system that are giving uh, cylinders to the household. They just consume, they just consume what uh, they have to pay for. And then they can use their mobile phone to buy the unit to pay for it. And then uh, given that uh, this is, uh, uh, this activity are most, most of the time labor intensive. There are a lot of people involved in it. Therefore, they are able to recover most of their costs. So this is um, uh, so far what we are happening. We, we have also noticed in Kenya that the success, the pilot program actually uh, pushed the government to, um, to allocate, to subscribe a, a budget, to create a budget within the Ministry of Energy that is actually promoting slum electrification and also street lighting, uh, which were not there before, because the saving they are making in slum, they are able also to provide uh, street lighting in the slum area. Uh, these are services that were not there before, and, and, and today they are there, given that it's, it's really a win-win situation. Yes, and I don't know if you noticed in one of the earlier case study slides uh, where the, the electricity was provided, there was also a street and a, and a pole. As you remember in the Accra study, if a, if a person wanted the, um, the electricity 
that family, that household had to pay for the pole, for the installation of the pole, as well as the electricity. So it's a uh, an issue to try to uh, increase services in general in these in these communities. I believe Michelle LaRue has a question. Hi, hey, thank you very much. Um, and I was just wanting to to ask on um, the the first speaker's last slide. There were two two figures illustrated there that that was quite important. The one was five hundred percent, and the others were the other one was sixty percent. I was hoping um, I was hoping that could be just um, reiterated, and I so that I could just hear that. And then to both speakers, I I I would really like to ask if they can tell. Or, or explain um, the average size, and I know that's very relative. Um, Biodigester. How many? How many households does that serve? Thank you very much. I believe that's the Dr. Mensa. Thank you. Thank you for the question. Um, two figures: five hundred percent, sixty percent. So, from our study, we found that that the cost of connection. The, the cost of connecting electricity to uh, their homes is actually 500% higher than the original cost. And this is as a result of a number of factors. First, there are no electricity poles in the community, so you have to buy extra pole. Second, you know, in Ghana, the electricity company of Ghana gives a certain meter of the um, electricity cable to you when you pay for, legitimately pay for the meter. However, looking at the distance where you have to draw the light from to your, your home, you need to get additional uh, wire or cables to be able to do that. And then also the middleman in between. So all these things put up together makes the cost of connecting electricity to your home very high, as high as 500% of the original cost. In terms of the tariff, we saw as high as 60% of the original cost, simply because most people actually connect electricity from a neighboring house. And it is more of a commercial business in the informal settlement. Somebody manages to be able to get a middleman electricity official to connect electricity to your home and they use it for business. So you draw from their house and then they give you the amount that you're supposed to pay. In other places, they count the number of appliances you use in your house. Each appliance will cost this amount and then they total. So in terms of the tariff, it goes as high as um, 60%. Now you talk about in terms of the biodigester. I think there's a difference between the biodigester and then the biogas. And here the emphasis is more on the biogas. The, the use of the um, byproducts of, uh, I mean, human waste to be able to generate this gas for. One of the house that we saw in the, one of the communities actually housed 60 people. And these 60 people depend on this biogas system. So they have a central place that all the toilet go into and then is able to uh, change into this uh, biogas system for them to use. The other one was a public toilet. And they decided to incorporate this kind of biogas system into it. So in that community, close to 6,000 people in that community actually use because there's, there's no space. As I mentioned earlier on, they don't have access to uh, basic services. So toilet facility is one of the major, in fact, it is estimated that 80% of people in Ghana actually do open defecation. And this is as high as about 50% in the cities. So if you come to Ghana, if you go to those who live along the beaches, they, they actually go to do open defecation along the beaches. So when you put up such a facility, almost all the people in that slum community use that. So they actually, about 6,000 people in one of the communities use this public facility that generates this biogas. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Very useful. Thank you. Well, yes. Lots, lots uh, of Thank you. <laughs> let, let, let me, yes, let me just add uh, what uh, Dr. Mensah just mentioned. And, and um, uh, it's, it's the fact that 
Biogas um, is a byproduct of the sanitation uh, system that are provided in informal setting. And um, uh, this question has been asked several times. Uh, in, in Kenya, where in Kenya we, we have uh, implemented uh, uh, the use of biogas in several places, in, in, in prisons, in school, and also in hospital, and, and, and also in public space, like uh, along the beach in, uh, of, of, uh, of, of, uh, of Senegal, of Dakar in Senegal. Uh, basically, one of the reasons why we opted for the biodigester was because it was able to address uh, the waste management uh, through uh, processing this waste and release to the environment a waste that is protect that that is uh, processed and also free from pathogen. Um, and then, in addition to that, you will also release the biogas for for cooking. Um, I have to say that, and this is what I've always been saying that uh, we should not put emphasis on the biogas per se, but we should put emphasis on the environment that this type of technology is there to address. But again, um, once you put baggers in cities, in, um, in hospital, university, and I know that Accra, for example, is one place where I have visited more than 20 baggers system, being in city, in hospital, and also in, um, in, uh, in, uh, in mosque, in a religious place, uh, you actually realize that it's really a system that is, that is working very well. Now related to the site, what I will say is that for the public system that I've seen, the smallest one that I've seen, um, it's uh, 16 cubic meter of the biodigester, 16, that this is the smallest one. It can go up to 1,000 to 2,000 uh, cubic meter. Uh, we, for example, um, uh, just to give you an example, in, um, in the prison in Kigali, uh, one biogas system was built there. It was so successful in the sense that it reduces the energy demand for cooking for the prisoner by 60% that the president of uh, Rwanda decided that all prisons in Rwanda should be provided with a biogas system. And, and now uh, it has been also expanded to include schools, and also um, public space, public uh, uh, facility where this technology is being used. So it's, it's definitely a good technology that addresses not just the sanitation issue, but also the environment issue and also produce in the process, the gas that is used for cooking or for heating. So I hope that uh, this uh, uh, this is this is what our experience showed. So we 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 continue uh, promoting this technology as an alternative way of addressing uh, uh, um, on-site sanitation system. Considering that most of the city in developing countries do not have sewage line, therefore, if they are to build new uh, sanitation system, they need to consider the biodigester because in addition to process uh, the, the, the liquid waste, they also produce byproducts that come in the form of biogas and also compost that is also good for agriculture. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Mensa and Dr. Kitio. This has been an absolutely wonderful presentation. So very, very thought provoking about the issues that we're facing around the world and the potential for very, very important uh, solutions that you are promoting. And we have great hope for your work to continue and to become scaled up so that we can see next year, perhaps more progress in this area. I want to thank you all for attending Energy Week at Penn. Uh, this is a very special panel that we've just had. We will be putting this uh, transcript online. We will also be, if anybody has other questions that were not answered, we will respond to those questions uh, to you as soon as we can. And we thank you very much for coming and 
listening and learning from our two very eminent experts on this subject. Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone, for coming. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you for the invitation. Uh, of course, UN Habitat is open to, to, to participate to, to, the, to, to this debate and other debates that are related to the human settlement. We have oh, experts in mobilities and uh, in waste management, in housing, which is also another very, very uh, important uh, topic. Uh, because uh, today we uh, just in sub-Saharan Africa, we the housing needs there is huge. We are estimated to 1. Uh, 160 million people that are homeless, which needs um, houses to be built. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. And we look forward to these discussions continuing at the Habitat Assembly that will be held in June and the World Urban Forum that will be held sometime in the fall of 2024. So thank you very much for your attending. And we will continue this conversation and bring our experts back at another time. Bye bye. Uh, thank you.